a rough five days for stocks. As always, we have reaction and insight from many of the world's leading voices. Graham Fisher banking analyst Josh Rosner, Michigan Democratic Senator Carl Levin, and UBS Securities senior U.S. economist Drew Mattis. And here to walk us through everything, Mike Norman, chief economist at investment bank John Thomas Financial. Also, our own Joe Brasuela, senior economist for Bloomberg LP. Guys, welcome to Rewind. Nice to be here. All right, we got a lot of ground to cover. Let's start with a look at trading a mixed and relatively flat close on Friday. But take a look at the weekly scorecard. Very different story, right? Substantial losses across the board. Stocks under pressure all week as investors worry about Greece, Spain, and what the future may hold for the Eurozone. We thought we were over this six months ago. What happened? Investors also worrying about the strength of China's economy. And then the big news, J.P. Morgan Chase shares plummeting after the bank discloses a $2 billion trading loss. J.P. Morgan now downgraded by Fitch and Federal Reserve officials are gathering more information about the trading position at the bank. Many market watchers have been telling us this is a very bad sign for the overall banking sector. Here's Phil Angelides, the former chairman of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. This is really a reminder that the whole derivatives markets, a $600 trillion market, is still in the shadows, still not transparent, and it's a reminder how little has changed and how the pace of reform has been too slow. Our financial system is still at risk because of the lack of restraints and the risks being taken. Well, for more on J.P. Morgan, let's bring in Paul Miller. He is banking analyst at FBR Capital Markets and a former examiner for the Philadelphia Fed. Paul joins us on the phone from the Southside Restaurant in Alexandria, Virginia. Paul, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. No problem. As I understand it, this loss of about $800 million uh, after tax is about $0.17 cents of uh, loss to the earnings line on a base of $4.87. On the surface, it doesn't sound like a lot, but from what I gather, it's, uh, it's really what's happening behind the scenes that's a concern. What's your take? Well, you know, the true losses of this position is $2.3 billion. They offset it with some security gains that they had on their balance sheet. So in about a five-week time period, they lost $2.3 billion. The other issue that concerns everybody is that Jamie said that it's material losses throughout the year as they try to unwind the position. What they, found, what they ended up with was a very illiquid position that it's going to take time to unwind. The problem is I think most of the hedge funds already know what this position is, and it's going to be difficult to unwind wind it orderly um, without some more material losses down the road. So, yes, on the, on the flip side is, yeah, it, it's, it's not that big of a number. It, the capital positions are going to be okay. Um, they probably lose more than 2.3, probably gets as close to 7 or 8, maybe even $9 billion, but it doesn't impact the capital position of the bank. But what it does show is how quickly a trade can go bad on you. Now, I don't think the derivative markets are completely out of control. I, I'm not in that camp, but it does show that these banks are very large, maybe too large to manage and at, at some point you got to start shrinking them well you know that's the million dollar question what does this actually mean for the rest of the banks uh, can you try to quantify this for us paul well, I do think this is an isolated incident with J.P. Morgan. I do think that they were trying. I don't think it was a hedge. I think they were trying to make a bet, and it went wrong because it got too big. But I don't think that the other banks are doing the same thing. But on the other side of this is that you're going to continue to see these one-off issues that are very damaging to the banks as they try to – take um, more risk to try to earn money in this environment where it's very difficult to make money for banks. The year curve is flat. Um, the, you got the Durban bill and other regulatory issues that, that um, has uh, hindered your, 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 your making you know, non issue income money, and therefore they're taking risks on the outside of these trading positions. But at the same token, it's not, it did not put the bank at risk. What it does is make the income very volatile. But I do think this was isolated. However, I do think you find isolated instances across the board over the next couple of years in these banking institutions. What do you make of the two headlines that came out after the close? On the one hand, Fitch lowering the long-term credit rating by one notch, S&P downgrading the outlook, I should say really lowering the outlook to uh, negative, which means they might ultimately downgrade. What do you make of those two headlines? Well, 
Well, again, it's it's after the fact, right? The rating agency has always been in the rearview mirror type situation. I don't think this is a big surprise for anybody. I also think it's already been factored in the name. The stock was down roughly 10% today, and that was already, you know, so, so a lot of this stuff is already factored in the name. The, the, the bottom line is what we think is, and why we downgraded the stock today, it's dead money until we get further clarifications exactly what happened. I think a lot of news stories that hit the tape of what happened, and it started out as an instant trade that went bad. And that's how quickly things can go wrong in the derivatives market. However, I don't think it's putting the bank at risk. What it's done is made um, the bank's earnings the, the, the earnings more volatile. Paul, this is Joe Brusuelos. What are the regulatory implications of this uh, development at J.P. Morgan? And do you think we're moving closer to the separation of the big trading operations from these commercial banks? I don't think we have, but what we've done, what, what, what we're going to do is like we call the front end regulations versus, versus the back end regulations. You're going to see much, you're going to see more regulators inside these banks. My guess is when this stuff hit the tape back in mid March about this, um, the London whale. We went out there, and even in print, saying that the regulator is probably on top of this, Jamie's on top of this, and we were completely incorrect. These guys did not know the positions they were really taking. So what you're going to see is the Fed and the OCC sending more people inside these banks and asking more questions, which are probably going to result in these guys you know, lowering the risk in these positions. But I don't think it's going to have an impact on the Volcker rule. I don't think you're going to see any regulations out of Congress on this, but I do think you're going to see the, the, the regulators spend more, have more scrutiny on these situations. Hey, Paul, we only have 30 seconds left before we have to uh, uh, let you go. Are you going to be lowering any other banks, or you truly believe this is an isolated event? You know what? The, the, we are already on the sidelines of Bank of America. We're on the sidelines now of J.P. Morgan. Wells Fargo does not have these type of trading instruments. Wells Fargo is a basic, a basic bank. We think that what we said in our note today, go to the simple banks, USB, PNC, Wells Fargo, that doesn't do this type of stuff, and you'll be fine. The big money center banks are just too big. All right, Paul Miller of FBR Capital, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your perspective as always, Paul. All right, when we return, much, much more on J.P. Morgan and Jamie Dimon's relationship with top regulators in Washington. Plus, later in the program, how Walt Disney plans to increase its share of box office revenue this summer. We will hear from Disney CEO Bob Iger. Rewind, we're back in two. How could Jamie Dimon make this kind of loss, keep this position open, which is what he says, if it were not for the fact that he's backed by an unconditional credit line from the Federal Reserve. That's what it means to be too big to fail in modern America. That was MIT professor Simon Johnson talking to us about that massive trading loss at J.P. Morgan. This is Bloomberg Rewind. I'm Adam Johnson in for Matt Miller. Well, let's hear more about J.P. Morgan and the debate over financial regulation from Josh Rosner. Josh is a bank analyst at Graham Fisher & Company. Stephanie Rule and I talked with him earlier today on Street Smart. Well, we should just say that none of these big banks have to file with the SEC at all because at the end of the day, there's no transparency. There's no ability to do real analysis on a, on a, on a business line by business line perspective. In fact, when you look at the stress tests that the bank regulators did, the Fed did, what you find was the trading book and the CBA desk. The Fed couldn't even get enough in comfort and enough information okay, to deal with it. It's just too complicated. Of course it's too complicated. But is, is that because these regulators are sort of outweighed by financial engineers? You know, Jamie Dimon himself had said the regulators are here all the time they know what's going on but are they looking for a needle in a haystack or do they even know what to look for well look a lot of the data they don't have on boarded the models they don't have in boarded there has to be management input into the actual uh, decisions with the with the trades and the regulators can't catch that on a daily basis nor should they be expected to at the end of the day an examiner comes in and raises concern notes that back at his district bank or back to the Federal Reserve Board supervision and then management comes in and says well where is he we don't agree and pushes back against the examiner how do you end up capturing that how do you end up as a regulator being able to follow through when Jamie Dimon can call the head of your supervision and regulation and say your examiners all wet Let's get reaction from Joe Busuelos of Bloomberg LP and Mike Norman of John Thomas Financial. Mike, let me ask you, uh, regulators all wet, right? 
that's kind of the way it seems, doesn't it? It is the way it seems, and I, but, but I think, you know, he made a very interesting point. Uh, Jamie Dimon, you know, is such a large figure in the financial industry. You know, some say he has a direct line to uh, the White House. That, you know, the he, golden boy. Yeah, that's the what golden boy. Well, look, the, the, the veneer is coming off of this guy. But I have to go to something that Simon Johnson said, and I've been hearing this throughout the day, was somehow putting the blame on the Fed. Look, um, J.P. Morgan risked its capital in a bet, a trade, which we're told was a hedge, but it's a Texas hedge, okay? Just an outright, uh, very speculative but, bet. The by the, by the way, Texas hedge means you're long the you're, oil you're, in the ground and you're long the yeah. future, you're long twice. And yeah. You're saying it's like a exactly. Texas hedge. Exactly. So, so look, okay, uh, they put this on, they risked their capital. Borrowing from the Fed, it, there's a cost involved. No bank wants to do that. It, it's sort of a tax. It might be a low one right now with rates very low, but it's not incentivizing this kind of activity because rates are low. They did this, in my opinion, out of ego and hubris. That defines Jamie Dimon. I think, you know, this guy Ixel, the whale, He's been out. His the name's been trader. out. Yeah, his name's been out there in the blogosphere for a long time. They wanted to push the envelope on this trade. It went bad. They risked their capital. It has nothing to do with the Fed incentivizing this. Joe. Well, I think there's three things here. First is is that this may be the the straw that breaks the proverbial camel's back, and that there's going to be a lot more regulation of, of what we call the post Wall Street landscape. Senator Second, Carl Levin has already sir, jumped yeah. all over. Oh yeah, no, yeah, this, this is this is not going to end. Second, you know, in many respects, Jamie Dimon was the last line of defense for Wall Street because his image has been tarnished. Now it's going to be open season in some of these banks. And I think the third thing is regulators just simply cannot keep up with the scale and scope of risk. And nor, nor can it keep up with the financial innovation of these global behemoths. Oh, they, they've been captured by the financial industry. Uh, you know, I, I think that's the, the pattern here is, is pretty clear that that has, has what's happened. For, and also, you know, um, banks should not be doing this as a profit center. I mean, we should have more narrow banking focus. Leave that uh, to and, the hedge funds. All right, exactly. up next, one of Facebook's co-founders is giving up his U.S. citizenship. Hard to believe? It's true. We'll talk about it. We do believe you need to have the ability to hedge in a CIO type position and that that Volcker allows that. This, this, this trading may not violate the Volcker rule, but it violates the diamond principle. We assume the diamond principle means uh, making money. Obviously, they lost plenty of money. That was J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon speaking to reporters on a conference call yesterday about the bank's huge trading loss. This is Bloomberg Rewind. I'm Adam Johnson for a look at other big Wall Street names making news and some of the day's most read stories on Bloomberg.com. Let's go out to Gigi Stone. Gigi. Well, Adam, speaking of which, we're learning more today about Ina Drew. She is J.P. Morgan Chase's chief investment officer. She's head of the unit responsible for that $2 billion trading loss. Well, insiders say Drew built her 30-year career there by embracing risk. She's one of two women who sit on that firm's operating committee. Her office oversees about $360 billion, and her operation has apparently been transformed under Jamie Dimon to make bigger speculative bets with the firm's own money. That's according to five former employees there. Then next name, Francois Hollande, the president-elect of France. Reports saying his attitude toward the wealthy is already prompting some French entrepreneurs to flee to neighboring countries. Hollande is a socialist who once said, quote, I don't like the rich. Spell it out. He plans to slap a 75% tax on income of more than 1 million euros. We'll see if he gets that passed, but still. Last name, Eduardo Saverin, the billionaire co-founder of Facebook. He's also made a move that may reduce his tax bill, renouncing his U.S. citizenship before the big IPO. Now, Saverin still owns about 4% of Facebook. At the high end of the IPO valuation, that 4% would be worth about $4 billion. Pretty amazing. And Adam, he's like the JFK Jr. of Singapore, apparently. High-flying bachelor out there with a. You know, I'm not. I'm not sure why a guy would necessarily want to move to Singapore if you're going to renounce your citizenship. Why Singapore? I think it's a lovely place to live. They're, it's very clean. They don't even let you spit your gum out on the street. You're not even run. allowed to chew gum in Singapore. <laughs> no, I think he has a, a pretty social, a vibrant nightlife and social life there. Well, I guess it's conveniently located to the rest of Asia. 
All right, Cheech, I think thanks. He's fine. Probably fine. Yes. All right, and remember, make sure you go to Bloomberg.com for all your latest headlines. We'll be checking in with Gigi just a little bit later for your uh, market roadmap. All right, here with me, Mike Norman and Joe Brisuelos. Guys, I, I don't know. I can't get over this. A guy renouncing his citizenship. And, and you know, that's been happening a lot lately. I've been reading about that. I mean, really, uh, many Americans now renouncing their citizenship. And that was something just, you know, 10 years ago unheard of. But, right, Singapore? I mean, come on. I, I thought, you know, maybe Brazil or someplace like that. Joe, but, you're, uh, you're, you're a level-headed economist. I mean, what do, you, what do you make of this? I think we've got a multinational elite who prefer to take their billions to tax-free havens that simply aren't willing to absorb the increase in cost that are going to be associated with the, the increase in taxation in the highly indebted advanced industrial